Hello. So we continue the uh, numbers of our international number two conference with the annual Ramana John Colloquium. This was uh, instituted back in the year 2007 by Mishra Alani. Uh, it was, has been supported by uh, Professor George Andrews of Penn State. And it takes place every year during this annual uh, two months that he visits us in Gainesville. We're very glad to have him. Our department has a very strong program in the areas of mathematics. The bullet spot, the model John, and uh, so this we had an excellent series of talks. The first talk actually was given by Manjul Bhargava back in 2007, uh, Peter Sarnan, Gloria Goldsbell, Kanan Sabarat, Ramajan, John Thompson, Ken Olero, Peter Paula, and Robert Vaughn at the previous speakers. I'm going to uh, pass this over to George in a minute, but let me say about that uh, George Andrews is an MQ professor at Penn State University, one of the world's premier authorities in the theory of partitions and the work of uh, Srinivasa Ramanujan. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he has had close ties with our mathematics department for quite some time. He was the recipient of an honorary doctorate at the UF back in December 2002. He's a distinguished visiting professor each year in the spring term. During 2008 and 09, he was president of the American Mathematical Society. So, George. Thanks, Doug. Thank you all for being here. So, I want to introduce to you the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, David. Richardson, who is a distinguished chemist. He has served this university for a lengthy period of time as the department head of chemistry and now as dean of the college. And I should point out to everyone who sometimes worries about chemists that he's a great friend of mathematics. So <laughs> we will introduce our speaker this evening, David. things, I have to say. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited to welcome you to the Buddy McKay, uh, excuse me, the Buddy and Ann McKay Auditorium here in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. It's a great facility for a conference, and this conference is uh, obviously off to a rousing start, a great success, and uh, uh, Krishna and I were talking about how the whole thing got started and how uh, it's great to see that it is now happening and it is such a great success. I, I know that you've been having a, an excellent time today. Now, one of the most intriguing aspects of this uh, conference is that it seems to be somehow associated with Krishna's 60th birthday. And so this is a, this is a rather uh, auspicious occasion and our lives. Uh, I've passed that mark, so I look back fondly on that day, uh, and I'm sure he's looking forward, or has passed it? Passed. Passed? Okay, so that's all. Just hey, passed. It's all a big, just passed, all right. Uh, so I was, however, surprised to see that it's not this Krishna Alati. When I looked at the picture on the materials <laughs> for the conference, it was pretty clear that it was some Krishna Alati who is now in college. He <laughs> 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 using his college picture. <laughs> Uh, in the brochure. Uh, very well. So it must be. So, as usual, when we have a Ramanujan colloquium, my task of introducing the speaker is quite simple because speakers in this colloquium rarely, if ever, need any introduction whatsoever to a crowd like this. Uh, however, uh, I am very pleased today to introduce James Maynard from Oxford University. And I will tell you that the name of his college is Moreland College. And this I'm doing just to make sure that you understand that I learned how to pronounce it correctly <laughs> just a few moments ago. <laughs> Thank you for that, James. Uh, I will say that it's quite clear that James is a, a superstar of number theory. And uh, his talk today, I believe, is Linear Equations and Primes. The title has not changed. 
Uh, he is a, uh, in the last two years, he just goes along and picks up awards along the way, the Sostra Ramanujan Prize in 14 and the Whitehead Prize in 15. Uh, please join me in welcoming James. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Good stuff. Um, okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great honor to be here. It's um, given the Mountain Coat Boom, and um, it's actually my first time in Florida, so I'm very happy to be here as well. Um, but I'm particularly pleased to be here because it's Christian Alade's 60th birthday conference. And unfortunately, I only had the pleasure to um, first meet Krishna just a couple of years ago associated with the Managing Prize. But, um, and Manjul's already said this in words of better than I can manage, I'm afraid, that my time with Krishna uh, during the Managing Conference was absolutely fantastic for me. Um, so it's a great mathematical experience personally to go and see the Managing's hometown, but it was also um, exceptionally satisfying and a huge amount of fun. And the key reason it was a huge amount of fun was because of the extreme hospitality of Krishna, who just took care of absolutely everything and made me feel certain. So I'm very, very grateful still for you, to you for being such a wonderful host then, and I'm very, very happy to be able to speak here at the conference. So, my talk is called Living Equations of Times, but I want to start off just thinking about gaps between time numbers. So, uh, I guess the most basic result in this area is the prime number theorem, which tells us approximately the number of times that are up to some large number of x. And this says the number of times less than 2x is x divided by the log number of x, and this means that. If we look at the average gap between primes up to size x, then amongst these primes, the average gap is of size the logarithm of x. So in particular, the average gap gets larger and larger, and average times gets faster and faster. But we, despite, we feel that despite the fact um, the average gap is of size log of x, sometimes we expect the gap between primes to be rather smaller than this average, and sometimes we expect the gap between primes to be rather larger than this average. And my talk today is going to be very focused on, well, how small can they be and how large can they be. So first of all, <coughs> let's think about small gaps between primes. Is it the case that the prime gaps are always as large as the log of x, where the primes are of size x, or is it the case that sometimes the primes can be rather small? Okay. Well, primes are certainly integers, so we can try and classify prime gaps. And we know that since they're integers, the smallest possible gap between any pair of two primes is going to be of size 1. And if you think about it for the moment, any two consecutive numbers, one of them has to be an even number, there's only one even prime which is 2, so the only possible pair of primes which shift by exactly 1, it has to be the pair 2, 3. So we classify all pairs of primes which shift by 1. So the next thing to do is to classify all pairs of primes that shift by exactly 2. Okay, so we start off, we find 2, 5, 5, 7, 11, 13, keep on going a bit, get up to 1,000, first prime, pair of primes after 1,000, which differ by exactly 2 is 1,031, 1,033, keep on going, get up to a million, get up to a million and 37, a million and 39, keep on going, get up to a billion, get a billion and 7, a billion and 9, and these guys just seem to keep on coming on and on and on. Uh, so, okay. As mathematicians, when we see something, uh, we just say, well, let's make a conjecture about it. So, we naturally conjecture then that there should be infinitely many pairs of primes which should by exactly 2. This is, as I'm sure everyone in the audience is well aware, the famous spin prime conjecture, and it's one of the oldest and most famous problems in mathematics, and we still have no real good idea of how to prove the spin prime conjecture. So it's still very much an open problem. But, why stop with 2? OK, we got slightly stuck at 2, but we can just continue. And exactly the same comments that I had with gaps of size 1 will work with any odd pair of gaps. That if you have a 
have integers, which is just one times hundred, and one of them has to be even, so there's only one even fine. So there's at most one pair of fives so that differ by some odd number range. However, if we look at the actual size four, then just in the same way we found lots of pairs of primes that differ by exactly two, we found there's lots and lots of pairs of primes that differ by exactly four. And similarly for six, similarly for eight, and similarly for any small or even number that you want. And so, despite the fact we don't know how to prove the, maybe the easiest case, or the first case, uh, we can conjecture that not only should there be infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by exactly two, there should be infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by exactly h for whatever even number h you wish to pick. And so this is the polymax conjecture that came up in the talk of Janosch Pinkett's earlier. But we don't even need to stop there. Let's not worry too much that we don't really know how to prove any of these things. Uh, we don't need to just be looking at pairs of primes. We can look for triples of primes. So how clustered together can three primes be? And we find that if we're looking for triples of primes that are all contained in an interval of length 5, then 235, 237, 257, and 357 are the only triples of primes contained in an interval of length 5. And the reason for this is essentially that if none of them is even, so we exclude the prime 2, then we must have a triple of form n and plus 2 and plus 4, but then one of them has to be multiple of 3. And there's only one prime which is multiple of 3, so it has to either involve a 2 or a 3, and we can classify them all. <coughs> okay, so we classified all primes which, triples of primes which are contained in the interval of length 5, or about the interval of length 6, and just like we found in pairs of primes that differ by 2, we start finding lots and lots and lots and lots of these triples that differ. The all contained in the interval of length 6. And so we naturally conjecture that there's infinite many. So maybe you're wondering, okay, so he's come up with a few conjectures and he's just going more for wilder and wilder and wilder different crazy conjectures. And the, I want to stop the craziness where we go for k different linear functions. So just integer functions in one variable, functions of the form. A and plus B, you, for, you take K of your favorite numbers like this, linear functions L1 up to LK, and we can consider is it going to be the case that L1 of M up to LK of M can all be simultaneously prime infinitely after? Well, we've already seen that that can't be the case because LN plus 1 can't be prime infinitely after. And so we've got these problem, problematic triples because for some configurations, one of the elements has to be modular 2 or modular 3. And one way of stating this precisely in the general case is to define the idea of admissibility of your set of linear functions that you've chosen. Say so a set of linear functions is admissible if there isn't one of these trivial mod p reasons why they can't all be simultaneously found. And so the other way of saying that is if I look at the product function, which is a product of your linear functions, it's not the case that this is always the multiple of some fixed product. So for n times n plus 1, it's always a fixed product, it's always a multiple of 2, whatever integer you put in, and so it certainly can't be prime infinitely after. And we say a set of linear functions is admissible if the product has no fixed prime divisor. And then the big general conjecture in this area is the prime k tuples conjecture which we've already heard a little bit about today in Dan Goldstein's talk, and will come up in other talks. It says this very clear, obvious condition that the functions must satisfy if they're possibly going to be simultaneously prime is in fact sufficient. This weakness of the condition is sufficient and we can get a complete classification of when your set of linear functions uh, can be simultaneously prime, and it's given by this condition of admissibility. So if you have an admissible set, I'll work to OK, then it should be the case that there's infinitely many integers n such that all your linear functions are simultaneously prime. So this is a generalization of um, the twin prime conjecture now to lots of different linear functions and many of them being prime simultaneously. And this has a huge number of consequences throughout um, mathematics. So for the problem of small gaps between primes, it almost completely solves the problem. So we've already seen that. Uh, a very simple case of the true final conjecture gives us that there's going to be many pairs of times that differ by <coughs> 2. That's just taking the first function to be L1 of n equals n, the second one being L2 of n is n plus 2. 
more generally, if we're looking for clusters of primes, so maybe n plus 1 primes all together, we find that it should be the case, assuming the prime Kuhn's conjecture, that there's n plus 1 primes all contained in a short interval of length of roughly n log n. And one way to say, see this is just to choose all our data functions to be shifts, so the four um, n goes to n plus hi, where hi are different constants to make sure that admissibility works. So it's a functional exercise that if you choose hi to be the i prime which is bigger than k, so you solve the first prime bigger than k, the second prime bigger than k, the k prime bigger than k, um, this gives you an invisible set of linear functions, and the, because all these hi's are moderately small, from the prime number theorem, we know that hi's are all bounded by um, roughly k log k. This gives us that we get m plus 1 primes in an integral of length roughly m log n for any integer n. So we therefore expect that despite the fact that the primes get sparser and sparser on average, infinitely often the primes should come very close together, just two apart, and in fact, infinitely often we should get these very dense clusters of primes which are all contain these very short intervals, because they're all bounded length intervals, and in fact, if we let the length of the interval go, we can get arbitrarily many primes in just a bounded length interval. But the function of Hubert's conjecture also goes way further than that, because it allows you to use arbitrary linear functions. So, for example, if we take L1 of n to be n, L2 of n to be 2n minus 1, this is saying that there's infinitely many Sophie Germain primes. So, they're called Sophie Germain primes because um, they um, featured heavily in Sophie Germain's early work on Fermat's last theorem, and it's the case that Fermat's last theorem, or at least the case of Fermat's last theorem, Holds for the exponent p whenever p is the Sophie Germain prime. And this is much easier to show than Andrew Wilder's full proof of Fermat's last theorem. So, but this caused mathematicians to naturally study Sophie Germain primes, which are primes p such that two p minus one is also a prime. Moreover, if we knew that there were infinitely many Sophie Germain primes, we'd be able to solve the Martin's conjecture on infinite degrees. Um, so this is another famous. Open conjecture, um, which would just be solved totally trivially as an easy case of primary k Hubert's conjecture. We could take a sequence of linear functions, all of the four n plus j times k factorial, and this would give us a k term arithmetic proportion of prime numbers. So, there's a famous theorem relatively recently, just from 10 years ago, of Green and Tau, where the primes do indeed contain infinitely many um, k term arithmetic reference for k, and in fact what they used to prove this was building up a machine that proved a um, version of the prime k Huber's conjecture when you have multiple variables. And it's their multivariate version of the prime k Huber's conjecture that can't prove quite this, sort of, this specific arithmetic progression in primes, but can prove the primes contain arbitrary long arithmetic progressions, but again, it would just be a trivial consequence of the general prime k Huber's conjecture if we need that. Um, if you're, um, maybe this is a strict consequence of the punky with conjectures I stated it, if I was looking at L1 of n to be equal to n, and L2 of n to be some large even number minus n, then this is very closely related to Goldbach's conjecture. And in fact, we expect that any proof of the punky with conjecture will also allow you to restrict the range of your variables in the Markham and doing sense slightly, and so um, it, should, sorry, it should be a consequence of the Pankei Dupas conjecture, or at least a proof of the Pankei Dupas conjecture, that we get Goldbach's conjecture that any even number can be written as the sum of two primes, at least for all sufficiently large even integers. Um, finally, um, one other example I have is that we could take primes of the form um, L i of n is n plus some small constant h i times q, and this would show that there's some residue class mod q, which contains many primes, and again, if I'm allowed to fudge things slightly with the size of the variables, it contains many primes which are relatively small compared to q. And it turns out that this is one of the absolutely vital ingredients in resolving problems to do with large gap screen primes rather than small gap screen primes, which I hope to touch on a bit later. Um, <coughs> And there's many other consequences of Pankei Hubert's conjecture, and I think you'll be hearing about different bits of recent work on Pankei Hubert's conjecture and consequences of it um, in other talks in this conference.
So, okay, so I've given you this big conjecture, this big machine that Frank Hitchin was conjecture, and I told you it has all these wonderful consequences. Okay, that's all well and good, but we don't have to prove any of the basic cases of the Frank Hitchin's conjecture. And so on its own, it's a nice thing to have, but we really want to get, you know, we're not we want to prove something. Um, but it turns out that, based on work of Gauss and Pinson and Dillon, um, you can study small gaps between primes by looking at weak forms of the Planckian two plus conjecture. And in particular, we can show unconditionally that there are primes which come clustered very close together in the sort of sense that um, the Planckian two plus conjecture predicts, um, without needing to establish the full strength of the Planckian two plus conjecture. So, I guess most famously, this was first achieved. Um, about three years ago, by Yi Zhang, Zhang, who showed there's infinitely many bound gaps between primes, showed there's infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by no more than 70 million. Um, then I and independently Cal, about six months later, came up with a different way of proving the bound gaps between primes results that had slightly better um, numerics for the size of the largest gaps between primes, so 70 million came down to. 600, although I guess there's this polymath project going on, they've already gone down a bit below 5,000, um, but also have consequence that we can show many primes clustered together, um, which was a, um, which would have followed from any variant of Zhang's methods. Um, so if you want the current record, um, I teamed up with the polymath project that was led by Tao um, to optimize all the numerical constants coming out of new ideas and incorporate as much of Shang's work as we could. And uh, we managed to get the current record, which is that there's infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by no more than 246. So 246 isn't quite two, but that's as close as we've got right now. So I mentioned before that um, these results on small gaps between primes are based on unconditional variance of the Planckian Dupus conjecture. So, the Planckian Dupus conjecture is this wonderful thing, but maybe it's a bit optimistic to try and hope that we can really prove the Planckian Dupus conjecture. So, a natural thing to do is well, if I can't get quite the Planckian Dupus conjecture, what's the closest I can get to it? Is there a weak version of the Planckian Dupus conjecture that I can prove? And this is the weak version of the Planckian Dupus conjecture that all the previous results are based on, and the one that I want to focus on today. Um, and here, if we remember the Planckian Dupus conjecture, it said you pick whatever your favourite k linear functions are, and if they're not admissible, we know straight from the back that they can't be simultaneously prime and infinitely often. Whereas the Planckian Dupus conjecture says that if they are admissible, then they should be all simultaneously prime and infinitely often. And what I want to consider is, you give me an admissible set, but rather than asking for all of your functions to be simultaneously prime and infinitely often, I'm just asking for some of them to be prime and infinitely often. So in particular, here I'm looking for, instead of all k of them to be simultaneously prime, just m of them being prime. For some m that's going to be slightly dependent on k. And Jones was also on the small gaps between prime, so it's actually based on really establishing a weak form of this Planckian Dupus conjecture. So he said that Planckian Dupus conjecture holds this weak form when you take two, you can guarantee two of the things being prime, provided you start off with a missile set containing at least two and a half million different linear functions. We don't know at all which pair of them are simultaneously prime, we just know that amongst all the two and a half million we choose two different possible pairs, there's one pair that is simultaneously prime. And uh, my variant, uh, which allowed you to prove the Planckian Dupus uh, prove many primes simultaneously, said that if k is big enough in terms of m, so roughly um, exponential in m, e to power four, m is the key dominant term here, um, then you get m of your linear functions being simultaneously prime, m out of k of them. Um, and if you just want two of them to be simultaneously prime, then it's good enough to have 105 different functions. Um, and then when you choose your functions to be able to form m plus h i, which shifts as we had before, uh, you have to do some work to find out precisely how compressed you can choose your h i's, 
but are going to give you the results that we had before on small gaps between primes and primes that come clustered very close to each other. Um, and finally, the polymath results, um, which gets infinitely many pairs of primes and different binomials, more than 246, is exactly the same type of argument. It shows a weak form of the Planck Hoops conjecture holds, where to get two of your linear functions being simultaneously prime, all you need is to start off with 50 different linear functions, such that the whole set is invisible. And provided you give me that, then I can guarantee that at least some pair of these linear functions should be simultaneously prime and often. Of course, because we think the Planck Hoops conjecture, we think that they should all be simultaneously prime and often, but we don't know how to prove that. So, okay, I've said that um, it's clear that the weak forms of the planetary Hilbert's conjecture are weaker than the planetary Hilbert's conjecture, but it's not clear that they're actually any easier to prove for a real mathematician. So how on earth might you go about thinking about proving one of these weak forms of the planetary Hilbert's conjecture? And the way that I like to think about these results is an application of the Erdos probabilistic method. So, on a very high level, this is going to be our line of attack. You take some, your favourite very large number, x, and I want to choose some integer n between x and 2x randomly according to some yet to be specified mathematical probability measure. And all I want to do is, with this random integer n, I want to count the expected number of the linear functions in your admissible set of linear functions, which are prime. Uh, so, n is just a random number, the number of the linear functions which are prime is also going to then be some random number, and I want to count, count the expected value of this random number. So, the expectation of the random number. And if the expectation is bigger than some integer n for every large value of x, well, if the expectation is bigger than n, then it must be the case that at least once there must be at least one value then between x and 2x, which has at least n of these linear functions being prime. And so if I can do this for every large value of x, this means I get infinitely many different um, values of n. And so in particular, I get infinitely many values of n, such that at least n of these linear functions are simultaneously prime. <laughs> okay, so... <coughs> That's our overall line of attack, but I seem to have just push the problems slightly further down the road. I've said that this is all based on some magical probability measure, and I guess the point I want to emphasize here is that um, this method isn't guaranteed to work at all. Um, if the expectation is, say, one half, then I get absolutely no information at all out of this whole line of attack. Um, because I know trivially that at least one of the functions is going to be prior to the Just from three shapes to one half a thumbs up. So the key idea, the key problem now is how left do we choose one of these probability measures? So there's maybe a couple of natural candidates. You could just choose n uniformly and random between x and 2x. You have no particular bias to any individual term. But unfortunately, we know that the density of the primes um, is goes to zero as so you look at bigger and bigger numbers. And this means that Certainly, the expected number of the linear functions, in terms of viewing the number of linear functions is fixed, is the expected number of them which are going to be prime is going to go to zero. And so this means that maybe the method would work for a few small values of x, but it's certainly not going to work for large values of x. And the whole method is going to completely fail. Because um, eventually the expectation is going to get arbitrarily smaller and close to zero, and certainly not be bigger than one, which is what we need to get two of them being some case to prime. So what we really need to do is find a probability measure that's somehow very concentrated on when many of these linear functions are simultaneously prime. So maybe another option is to say, well, I choose n uniformly random out of all of those um, integers n between x and 2x, um, such that all of the linear functions are prime at n. So this is going to be the maximum concentrated on when all the linear functions are prime. But it doesn't really provide a probability measure unless I know in advance that there's already one of the inches n such that all the linear functions are prime. And so this, that would be a decent way of trying to prove the prime k dubious conjecture if you already knew the prime k dubious conjecture. But unfortunately, we don't know the prime k dubious conjecture unless k is 
So we want to come up with something that's somehow in between the two. We want something that's easy enough to calculate that we can actually handle this expectation and really calculate it and get a value probability measure. But we also want to get something that's really concentrated on the prime numbers and when these linear functions are simultaneously perfect. And uh, one very natural way to do this is to use SIV methods. So I don't want to get into um, SIV methods in too much detail, but one way of doing SIV methods is as the study of almost primes. So um, I'm going to be vague about what I mean by almost primes, but for every integer n, I'm going to give it's some weight based on small prime divisors that's some very approximate measure of how prime the number is. So some non-negative weight. And the point is that if these weights only depend on relatively small prime divisors of n, then these weights can be calculated relatively easily using results about sets in arithmetic progressions and things like that. Um, and so they're not too difficult to calculate, which is why I called them moderate as opposed to easy, which is just using all the integers, um, or hard, which is really using the definition of the primes themselves, which would be analogous to us choosing a probability measure, which is um, just one in all of the um, linear functions are simultaneously prime. However, the key point is that we can construct um, suitable weights that depend on just the small prime divisors, but they're still reasonably concentrated on the primes themselves. And uh, so the key two properties come here and the ones in bold, um, the primes have positive density in the almost primes. So this is essentially saying that um, uh, the almost primes are some the weight to every integer, and now instead of the primes being a zero density subset of the integers, when we're counting with weights, they become a positive density subset. So this is actually very important in the green tail theorem on um, arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions of the primes. Uh, they do essentially the same, they prove a weighted version of semi radius theorem. Semi radius theorem, as we heard earlier, is any positive density subset of the integers contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Well, this is a positive density subset of weighted integers, and then the magic of their theorem is to be able to say, well, these weights are suitably like just a constant function one, the, the same thing applies. Um, but the key points are that the primes are, have positive density, and so we can, these are actually concentrated on the primes, but also we can calculate these almost primes, these weighted inches, reasonably well, provided we understand whatever set it is that we're looking at in arithmetic regression to use well. <coughs> and so this gives us a refined version of our GPY argument of how we're going to apply the Ehrlich probabilistic method where we're going to use our probability measure to be proportional to these SIV weights because these are nice, easy to calculate things but they're soon to be concentrated on prime numbers. So now we're going to choose our to n randomly um, between large x and 2 times x um, with weight probability to Wn, which is this SIV weight um, which is designed to capture <laughs> that um, all of L1 of N to LK of N is simultaneously prime. Now, in principle, there's this annoying normalizing constant in these, but we can calculate the normalizing constant, which is just essentially an average of these W of Ns, by just using results about integers in arithmetic regressions, which is really quite simple. Um, because essentially you can calculate any sum of W N over some set A, provided you understand A in arithmetic regression. But to calculate the expected number of primes, um, we also want to count the con contribution when any one of the individual terms is fixed as being a prime. But to do this, we just need to use results about primes in arithmetic regressions. And we also have very strong results at least on average about primes in arithmetic regressions in the form of, say, Bombier with the grand theorem. And this means that using these sim weights, um, we can calculate the expected number of the linear functions which are simultaneously prime if we're called choosing our numbers randomly according to this um, situation. And then comes the moment of truth. We prove some weak form of the Pankey Dupes conjecture, provided this expectation, which is now going to be some positive number, is it actually a number which is bigger than one, whereas if we get a number which is slightly smaller than one, the whole thing completely fails. But at least now we're pretty sure that 
Um, if you do this correctly, you get a number which is strictly positive, so you're not going to get zero. And unfortunately, um, this is then very sensitive on the precise definition of the weight you use and the precise type of signal you use, therefore the precise definition of what you mean by almost prime, which is also why I've been slightly fudging you and writing about what almost prime means. Um, but I guess the one point I make here is that um, regardless of what definition of almost prime you're using, essentially because this is all relying on small prime divisors and results about primes and arithmetic progressions, if you had better results about primes and arithmetic progressions, you could get a better expected number of your linear functions, which is simultaneously prime. So the question then turns out, how do we choose these weights which are prime on these primes? And uh, it turns out that there are problems like this, it's a so-called high-dimensional SIP problem, uh, and <coughs> in high-dimensional SIP problems, it's going to be the silver SIP, which is best actually performing the SIP. And if you ask a silver SIP to do a, if you ask a SIP theorist to apply the silver SIP to this problem, then not so long ago there's a sort of standard way of applying the silver SIP to this. And if you do some slightly tedious calculations, uh, you come out that if you choose x to be very large, then you get the expected number of your linear functions, which is simultaneous to prime, is about one half. So this is less than one, and this tells us absolutely nothing, and we completely fail. Um, so the key breakthrough of Gold's and Newton's new theorem was to show that actually there's a different choice of the cell of that you can use, and this is rather better than this problem. Um, and in fact, uh, Gilson and Vincent Newton's choice uh, gives the expected number of linear functions which are simultaneously prime as being just less than 1. And it gets arbitrarily close to 1 as you look at more and more, more linear functions. Which means they just fell by a whisker to prove a weak form of the Hooper's conjecture where you get two of the um, linear functions being simultaneously prime. And in fact, it was because they only just failed that they were able to use few extra things to still get some non-trivial results about how small gaps between primes can be, and this is really what cycle off this whole there. Um, so what did Jan do? Well, Jan proved a slightly stronger result about primes and arithmetic progressions. So I think this was mentioned more specifically in Dan Spencer's talk, but because he did ever so slightly better than the results about primes and arithmetic progressions that fed into uh, the original of Gold's and Prince and Theorem, he was able to get a very small but concrete improvement. And this meant that he improved the expectation from being 1 minus epsilon to 1 plus epsilon. And so he just got over this threshold, and this meant that this was just enough to get an expected number of your linear functions being uh, prime, which being 1 plus epsilon. And since it's bigger than 1, we know that 2 of them must be simultaneously prime, and therefore uh, you get bound gaps between prime. But epsilon here only, this 1 plus epsilon only becomes bigger than 1, provided k is large enough, and for his argument it turned out k being 2.5 million was the threshold for where it became large enough. Um, but the key idea behind um, my modification, and which was also discovered by Tao, was a different way of choosing these sub weights, um, and this one, this, um, when you work through these sieve weights, if you have k different linear functions, it turns out that at least if k is large, this gives an expected number of your linear functions which are prime as being about a quarter log k. So in particular, this expectation is getting larger and larger and larger, this k gets larger and larger and larger, and this is why we're able to show that um, the expected number is bigger than m if k is especially large exponential in m, and hence we form the We've proven a weak form of the Franklin Hoople's conjecture where we have an m of our linear functions being simultaneously prime. Um, and fortunately, also on the small scale of things, it turns out that the threshold for when this expectation becomes bigger than 1 numerically drops down quite a bit. And so, in my original work, it, the threshold for when this expectation became bigger than 1 turned out to be k of size roughly 105, and this is what gave us our. Uh, Weak form of the quantum Hooper's conjecture with two linear functions being simultaneously prime with k is 105, and then gaps between primes of size 600. Um, so, this is one slightly technical slide, uh, 
for those who are interested in, um, the key idea behind the new choice is to choose weights which look like a Silberg sieve weight. So Silberg sieves tend to be a sum of the devices D such that D divides the product of things that you maybe want to define. And then there's some constant slander D that you optimize later on. And the key modification here is actually an idea that goes back to Silberg that rather than have this um, one dimensional, one variable version of the Silberg sieve, because this is a multi variable problem, we can have devices D1 up to DK such that each device is, um, such that DI is a device of our ith linear component, and I have some constants that depend on each of these DIs individually. And this gives us a slightly bigger space within which to optimize. And it turns out this bigger space is absolutely crucial to getting improvement. So we choose SIF weights that look like this. And then there's some real numbers, lambda d1 to dk, that we want to optimize to try and make our expectation as large as possible. Um, and you can use various combinatorial optimization techniques to essentially show that the optimal choice of your lambda constants should be given by some arithmetic factors and then some multiplied by some strict function. The key point here is that once we have this form of the sieve weights, the arithmetic factors are totally explicit, the smooth function is not totally clear what the optimal one is in priority, but it reduces the entire problem of um, finding or proving these weak prime k tuples conjectures down to a smooth optimization problem. There's nothing to do with number theory. It's just an analysis problem, essentially. And moreover, it's an analysis problem that we can actually solve. Uh, you can view it as um, an eigenvalue problem for calculating the largest eigenvalue of a certain linear operator on Hilbert space um, and using concentrational measure and calculus of variations type results, you can get a good answer good low bound for this eigenvalue um, when k is large. Uh, when k is small, it turns out uh, it's more effective to use numerical analysis and reduce it down to a finite dimensional eigenvalue problem uh, where we have good numerical routines. And it turns out that for k in the region of k up to 100 or so, you can get um, essentially good enough bounds to give the best possible um, uh, kind of weak prime k conjectures you can hope from this method. So um, this eigenvalue problem can actually be solved um, as well as we can possibly hope for in the case of k is less than 100, and also we can solve it as well as we can hope for in the asymptotic regime as well. Um, and polymath used rather large computers than I did, um, and so along with a few modifications of the basic sieve ideas, um, that was the key reason that polymath was able to improve the threshold of 105 to 50. That they use them, they use them to a much bigger numerical eigenvalue problem. Um, but it turns out that more or less the same ideas worked, and uh, we choose these generalized forms of the Selberg sieve weights. It turns out this generalized Selberg sieve is exceptionally effective in this case. We reduce it down to a smooth optimization problem. We can solve the smooth optimization problem either using um, an app typical analysis techniques in the regime when k is large, or by using numerical analysis techniques in the regime when k is small, and this gives us our threshold for the expectation of when the expectation should be given 1, and when the expectation should be given n, and then uh, consequently our weak forms of the family Hoover's conjecture of when we get many of our linear functions being simultaneously prime. Okay, so I've talked a bit about Prime k tuples and how this makes small gaps in primes, and in particular how it makes um, builds on the earlier work of Goldman and Udo and Ocean to uh, the weak forms of the prime, uh, the twin prime conjecture. But I now want to switch gears slightly and for the main bit of my talk, think a bit about large gaps in primes. Uh, so this is the totally off question. Uh, we know again from the prime number theorem that if you take uh, prime size about x, then typically the next prime is about log x away from it. And the question is then, well, can, can it be larger than log x? And if so, how much larger than log, log x can it be? So this is cropped up in a couple of places. Um, 
and what we believe the truth should be here is that it should be able to be bigger than the average band of log x by a factor of about log x. And so this is Kramer's conjecture based on probabilistic ideas of a number. If you imagine that a number is called prime randomly with the sort of density that primes have, then almost all such random sequences would have this into maximum band between numbers of size and numbers. Now, unfortunately, this conjecture is way beyond anything we're able to prove. Um, so the best alphabet name for G of X is the result of Baker Harmon hints said that G of X is um, no larger than X to the power of 0.525, but X to the power of 0.525 is miles bigger than what we expect the truth to be, which is about log X squared. Um, however, we do know that G of X can be arbitrarily large compared to the average bound log of X. And this was first proved by Vesinthius, then um, Erdos proved Vesinthius' results, and there's a couple of results in between by Erdos and Rankin um, until the ground essentially stabilized in 1938 as this completely messy expression here. The G of x is bounded below by some constant times log of x times log log x times log 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 x divided by log 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 x all squared. Um, at least provided x is large enough for this quadruple log to be positive. Um, which is not a totally trivial <laughs> number of x in itself. Um, and so, um, it was a very famous open problem of, I guess, in the years after Rankin, there have been a few improvements to the implied constant here, first by Mayan Homelands, uh, maybe Schoenhauer had a uh, improvement as well, and then Ganesh Prince had the record up until a couple of years ago, and it's a very famous conjecture of from Chandler from the Paul Erdos, whether the implied constant here could be made arbitrarily large. So whether you could get the sort of weakest asymptotic improvement on Rankine's bound possible. Um, and the reason that this was viewed as a very challenging problem was that there was this very natural method of Erdos and Rankine, um, but to improve upon the Erdos Rankine result, you had to somehow either come up with a completely new way of studying large gaps between primes, and this is slightly difficult because large gaps are sort of defined by what they're not. They're saying, well, you want to have lots of numbers which aren't prime. Um, or you had to somehow find some new way of injecting new mathematical information into the Erdos Rankine method. It was clear that the Erdos Rankine method had essentially been optimized in a series of four or five papers by Erdos and Rankine in ten. And so, uh, Erdos' challenge problem was independently solved by a four-way collaboration with four Green, Kinyarkin, and Tau, and myself in maybe August 2014. And so the two rival teams then teamed up uh, to uh, get a, we just proved it in the weakest form, originally stated by Erdos, but we teamed up and we managed to get a positive improvement on Rankin's 1938 round, which Gives an improvement of triple log. So it's maybe in some quantitative sense not the biggest improvement in the world, but um, in a technical sense it's um, interesting because it injects new mathematical information into the method. And I guess if there's any graduate students in the audience who are um, complaining about how much they're paid for teaching and things, I think it's the case that Carol said that he's put a ten thousand dollar reward if anyone can get an arbitrary large improvement on the applied person. So maybe that's a better way to help you with this. Um, okay, I'm almost out of time, so I'll just be slightly brief about some of the ideas behind the class of actual primes. Um, and so this is method of urge ranking, and the way they do the large actual primes is to come up with a way of showing that every integer n going up to something which is a bit larger than x. Um, satisfies n has to be in the sub residue class AP1P for some prime P which is less than equal to x. So, another way of thinking about this is you take um, an interval starting at 1 and going up a bit beyond x, and we're crossing out all numbers in a residue class individually for each prime P less than equal to x. And the aim is to cross out every number in the entire interval. This is quite easy to do, give the intervals just 1 up to x. Uh, but the name of the game is to try and make the interval larger than 1 up to x, and the larger you can make the interval, the bigger the improvement you can get on um, the other 
And so they found, somewhat miraculously based on um, features of smooth numbers, that if you choose your worship classes AP to be um, roughly of this form, then using the Chinese Omega theorem, you can guarantee that you can indeed cover um, an interval which is slightly larger than x, and therefore you can get large gaps between finite. And <clears throat> the key idea behind my work with uh, Ford, Green, Kinyaga, and Tao um, is to improve the final stage of this argument. Um, so in the earth ranking argument, you choose AP to be 1 for small primes, AP to be 0 for medium primes, and then you look at whatever's left over. And by doing some calculations, you find that actually there's very, very little left over. And so you just choose greedily your APs to just knock out one of the remaining survivors. You can certainly do that. Then that's good enough if your interval is not too large compared to X. Um, but what we'd really like to do is to get a bigger interval, which means you'd have more things left over, which means that it's no longer good enough to just remove one survivor for each rescue class for every large prime. You want to somehow remove lots of them. And so you want to find lots of primes that are in the same residue class, um, modulo some large prime. And here, the prime which is the modulus is about as large as the survivors themselves. And so typically, there's no prime, there's no elements in a residue class. But we want to find residue classes containing lots and lots of elements. So we have to somehow find special, unusual residue classes that contain unusually many of these surveillance. And this boils down to, um, can we find an unusual residue class, much like Q, that contains many primes which are only slightly larger than Q? But we saw earlier that we can solve this using a form of the weak time Kiyotoukas conjecture, that if we choose our linear functions to form n plus HIP, where P is a given large prime, then we can guarantee that M of them is simultaneously prime and even often, and if the HI is always really small, this is going to give us M primes all in the same residue class modulo P, which is all going to be small compared to P. And so this allows us to improve on the other ranking argument and correspondingly improve on large gaps between primes. Um, so maybe I'll stop here. I just want to say one final consequence of some of these. Uh, we can humans conjectures, which goes back to some of the original results of Colbert's conjecture. So I mentioned in my talk yeah. that uh, you get better results if you have strong results about primes and affinity progressions. And so if you assume the most optimistic possible result of primes and affinity progressions, you get the most optimistic possible strengthening of our method. So the limitation of our method. And this conjecture, the most optimistic conjecture about primes and affinity progressions is a technical conjecture which I will call generalized out of Halberstam or GEH. And one amusing consequence of the polymath project was that if you assume this GEH conjecture, then well, we can't prove that the true time conjecture is true, and we can't prove that Goldbach's conjecture is true, but we can prove that either the true time conjecture is true or Goldbach's conjecture is almost true. Now, of course, we believe both of them to be um, true, but uh, we can't find quite prove this, but we can prove that they're not both false. Um, so maybe on that note, I'll end here and pass over to questions. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>
questions? Yes. Uh, many of you uh, might know uh, that Paul Ehrlich liked to offer small monetary prizes for conjectures and measurements. And uh, for example, Sam Reddy got a thousand dollar problem we mentioned today. And uh, he worried what would happen after he left and how could the people collect those problems. Well, in fact, as James mentioned, he did offer rashly, he wrote, $10,000 to show that the gap between consecutive primes is larger than any constant multiple times the Riemann function. And in fact, this was now settled nicely by James and also a other, the other team, for Green, Cognacan, and Tau. And so I thought it was only fair, uh, acting in some sense as Erdish's banker, because he did leave a certain sum to cover some of these emergencies. <laughs> so I have a uh, photocopy in large of something that will turn into a real check. <laughs> I, I thought it would be fair to split it 50 50. There's a,